Hi, everybody. How are you today? I hope you're doing well. I hope you're happy and healthy and uh, that you are joining us to learn today a little bit more about masks and gloves. This is a show that I have been dying to do for quite a while. I'm going to give other people a chance to drop in here because it is uh, it's a lot. I've prepared a slideshow for you and given it a lot of thought. So I'm hoping that you're going to be able to benefit from this. I want to start out by saying that, as I've said before, I am not a doctor. I'm not a frontline healthcare worker. Um, the science, let me just check here. Oh, Marcy, you're doing great. That's good. Awesome. Thank you. Um, this, I have a science degree, but I am not a scientist in the way that the scientists are whose data I'm going to be presenting you with today. There are a lot of really strong opinions around masks and gloves. So I firmly believe in two things. Number one, any of you who have watched the show before know that I am a strong, strong believer that you and me, we should advocate for ourselves, advocate for what is in our own best interests all the time. The other thing I strongly believe in is following the science, not rumor, speculation, and innuendo, science. I think maybe that is something that in decades gone by, we have become maybe a little lax about, but in this current COVID climate, we are all paying more attention to science. So that is what I am going to bring you today. And I have prepared for you, as I said, a slideshow about masks and gloves. We're going to start with gloves because it's a little simpler. I'm not going to take comments on the way through like I usually do on my live shows. But if you have any questions or comments, put them in the comments below. And when the presentation is completely done, I'll cycle back and we'll address any questions and comments that you have. We can go back to various slides um, and deal with any questions that you have. Okay, so let me get on here and share my screen. Okay, masks and gloves, making safe evidence-based choices. So the question really is, are gloves beneficial? or not. Now I'm talking about the medical gloves that you see people wearing in stores these days and all around everywhere. Well, it turns out that whether or not they are beneficial is really based on how the wearer uses them. Dr. Sumon Chakrabarty is an infectious diseases physician who gave a quote to CTV News, which is a national news station here in Canada, saying that in public, wearing gloves is unnecessary. That what he finds is that people are wearing the same set of gloves everywhere. And that by doing this, you are paradoxically putting yourself at more risk for infections. Now, the point that he makes in, his, uh, in the video is that the virus does not get in through mucous membranes, or sorry, the virus does, does get in through mucous membranes. That is your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. The virus does not get into your body through your skin. So using your gloves to cover up what may be your best defense doesn't really make a lot of sense. I will add to this that I have seen people going throughout town, I'll use one example, going to the bank. They put gloves on when they're in the car and then they get out of the car, they close it, they lock the door either by touching the door handle or by using their key fob. They go to the bank, they open the door, they go to the, uh, the machine, the banking machine, they're inserting, they're, they get their card out of their, their wallet, they insert it in the machine, they're touching the keypad to enter their pin code and continuing to touch it while they select what they want to do. Let's say they're getting money, 
When the money comes out of the machine, they take the money, they put it in their wallet, they take their card, they put it back in their wallet, close the wallet, put it in the purse or their pants pocket, whatever. And then they go through the door again and they go back to their car, open the car door, get in the car, close the car door, and then take their gloves off. How many things have they touched with those gloves as they have just done this simple task of going to the bank and getting money? Six, eight, 10 things, separate things they've touched. You have to assume that the virus is on everything. If it's on the first thing you touched or the third thing you touched, you are now transmitting it to every other thing you touch. And that is why wearing gloves is not beneficial. It would be more beneficial for you to use your hands and go through whatever process you're going through, get back in your car, and then put hand sanitizer of at least 60% alcohol on your hands and clean your hands that way before you touch anything else. Don't touch your steering wheel, don't turn your car on, clean your hands, and then go about your day. Now, I understand that you have also touched your card and your wallet and so forth. You've got to clean those things when you get back home. Don't forget to do that step when you get back home. Okay, so let's go on with our slideshow here. Think of a chicken. Think of a chicken when you're wearing your gloves. Now, we have all had a lot of really good education about how to handle raw poultry and not to touch anything else until we wash our hands with soap and water. None of us would think of handling raw chicken in this day and age and then going and picking up our cell phones or going to pick up another pot or pan without first washing our hands. So if you see gloves, think chicken and that will help you decide whether or not this is the right move. The only place I wear gloves, and, and it's my personal choice, is pumping gas. I put gloves on, I pump my gas, and then I discard my gloves when I'm done in the garbage can at the gas station, and I carry on. But I do not wear them in a public setting. I don't wear them when I'm shopping. In fact, in the town where I live, we have two grocery stores. One grocery store, a month, a month and a half ago, banned wearing gloves because they said that they could keep their environment cleaner if people use the hand washing station when they came into the store the employees had cleaned the store they keep the shelves clean and sanitized and then you go about your business shopping wash your hands again before you leave if you wish and then get back in the in the car and off you go they have banned wearing gloves so wearing gloves not so much what we should be doing. Okay, that answers the glove question. Now let's move on to masks. It's a far more divisive issue. As we all know, some countries and jurisdictions have indeed mandated the wearing of masks. Other jurisdictions have recommended the wearing of masks. Still others recommend wearing masks only when physical distancing can't be observed. Now, I want to be very clear. People who have chronic diseases, people who have comorbidities, need to assess their own risk and make their own decisions for themselves. Okay? We are talking about the normal population, the middle group, if you will. People need to make decisions that give them comfort. So I am not going to be telling you in this presentation, you should or you shouldn't. I am going to be giving you the science. And there is absolutely a right way and a wrong way to wear a mask. Wearing it the wrong way may bring you a lot of comfort, but you may well be distributing virus particles unintentionally by how you handle the mask. So it's not as simple as just whacking a mask on your face and calling it a day. Understand the difference between masks. Now, in our country, these three masks, I'm in Canada, by the way, for those who don't know, 
these three masks are not masks that should be worn by the general public. Of course, the face piece respirator, no, no, no. That respirator actually is about 99 to 100% uh, able to remove the virus. The filtration is actually anywhere from 95 to 99 or 100% for small particles. The N5, N95 respirators, and these are the ones that are asked to be kept for frontline healthcare workers. They filter out 95% of airborne particles. So not 100%, but up to 95%. The surgical masks, which a lot of people seem to want to wear, but again, in this country, they are not recommended for use by the general population, does not provide the wearer with a reliable level of protection from inhaling smaller airborne particles and is not considered respiratory protection. This is a document from the CDC, which is the Centers for Disease Control in the US. Okay, now in France, in France where uh, I happen to have a brother who lives, surgical masks were able to be purchased at pharmacies only with a prescription in the past. Now in the COVID environment, anybody can walk in and buy a box of 50 surgical masks. That's how things have changed. But remember that they are very loose fitting. You see under face seal fit, they are very loose fitting. And that is why they don't give you the protection that you might think they give you. Now I want to show you some of the falsehoods that we have been seeing around the internet, Facebook in particular. This one I see a lot, a lot, a lot. It's on the left-hand side. I, I don't see it with the, the, um, the verbiage that you see on the right-hand side. But on the left-hand side, it's, it's showing you the probabilities. Now, I checked this out. <clears throat> and if you go to Snopes.com, and you will see that reference in the bottom of your screen, Snopes.com, which is a fact-checking site and very reliable, they indicate that they have seen this across many platforms. And they also make a point of indicating social media has been a hotbed of really bad medical information. They were not able to find this chart on the CDC website. And the CDC confirmed to Snopes that it did not create this chart. And the agency could not confirm the accuracy of these statistics. Now, what Snopes was able to find out was from some of the clues, if you look carefully at the picture, you see here where the numbers are indicated, the percentage sign is in front of the number. That is not how we orient numbers and symbols in North America. If it was something that originated here, it would say 70%, not percent 70. So they were able to uh, ascertain that this probably came from Turkey and they were able to find a variation of this chart in Turkey. But again, it is false. Now, I want to mention to you as well from a debate which I will reference very shortly when we're talking about falsehoods, um, there is an assumption that wearing masks if you are asymptomatic is protection when you're out in the general public. Within the context of this debate, which I just finished listening to because it just got posted, most asymptomatic transmissions come from people who live together, who sleep together, and who poop together. Isn't that a lovely thought? Bear this in mind though, if you are a person who leaves a toilet seat up after you have used the toilet, you may want to rethink that if you're looking for protection. The studies have not been done on COVID, but they were done with past SARS viruses. And people who poop shed SARS virus in their poop. Other studies that have been done with toilet flushing, 
show that when you flush a toilet with the seat up, water droplets spray 10 to 15 feet from the toilet. <laughs> Isn't that a lovely thought? So that is why if you look not too hard, you will find that bacteria from poop can often be found on toothbrushes, hairbrushes, towels, walls, floors. It's because the water plume spreads. You don't see it because they are very, very tiny water droplets, but they do in fact spread. So if you do nothing else, people, those of you who do not close toilet lids may want to think about starting to close your toilet lid. Now then, I'm going to go back to my presentation here and we will move on to a site on Facebook where you can find a lot of information. And this is a site where I look. Uh, I happen to know this doctor. This is Dr. Ken Milne. Uh, he, he has a bit of a public persona as Bat Doc. Those of you who live in the area where I live will probably be aware of this. It's his way of sort of, with a sense of humor, being able to bring forward information that benefits the public. You know, people pay attention when Bat Doc shows up. He has this whole thing about flu vaccines. He, anyway, his site is called The Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine. You can read that. He publishes a great deal of information that is evidence-based science. Okay, a really good thing to look at. What he published a week, a week and a half ago that I want to reference for our discussion today is this. He had no part in authoring this, but this is an evidence-based, peer-reviewed, scientific journal article. And you can see the, uh, the date on it is April 1st, 2020, so it's quite current. This article, this review, was authored by two experts on respiratory protection and infectious diseases, both from the University of Illinois at Chicago. One of them retired. Now, you can read that. You go to the Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine. You can find this article posted. So I've just pulled out a few little pieces that are interesting. Here's one of them. Data lacking to recommend broad mask use. There is no scientific evidence that they are effective in reducing the risk of SARS-CoV-2. Now, they are talking, first of all, about cloth or surgical masks. Remember, we're not supposed to be wearing surgical masks, so let's talk about cloth masks. There is no evidence. I want to point out that, he, that the authors are referencing SARS-CoV-2. The disease is called coronavirus. The virus that causes the disease is SARS-CoV-2. You may be familiar with this kind of a reference from the last 30 or 40 years. HIV is the virus that causes AIDS. So there's a difference between the virus and the disease. So that's what they are referencing here, okay? They are referencing the virus itself in this. The use of masks may result in those wearing the masks to relax other distancing efforts because they have a sense of protection. Respirators are the only option that can ensure protection for frontline healthcare workers once all of the strategies for optimizing respirator supply have been implemented. But that's talking about healthcare workers, not the general public. And down at the bottom of this particular slide, we realize the public yearns to help protect medical professionals by contributing homemade masks, but there are better ways to help. And one of those ways is by keeping yourself healthy. Now, I will also reference here the Center for Disease Controls strengthened their stance on cloth mask wearing for the general public on April the 3rd. This is a statistic, by the way, that comes from Dr. Milne in the debate that, again, I'm going to reference in a moment, and you can listen to the debate. 
on April the 3rd, the date that they strengthened their stance, there were 280,000 cases of COVID in the US and 9,000 deaths. A little over two weeks later, April 15th, there were 1.5 million cases and 90,000 deaths. So the CDC strengthened their, their stance and said cloth masks should be worn by the population. But a little bit more than two weeks later, the cases had increased five times and the deaths had increased 10 times. So is that because people, let's go back to the slide, was that because they had relaxed their efforts and felt safer than they should have felt? Unknown. It could also be because of the material. Also from the same uh, article, they looked at the historical view of cloth masks, and they've been worn since the 1800s. The third paragraph, in sum, given the paucity, which is a fancy word for small amount, given the small amount of information about the performance of cloth masks as source control in real world settings, there is no evidence to support their use by the public or healthcare workers to control the emission of particles from the wearer. Masks may confuse the message and give people a false sense of security. After all, if masks had been the solution in Asia, where we know that mask wearing has for many years been the norm, shouldn't that have stopped the pandemic before it spread elsewhere? Now, this can all be very confusing. Doctors are confused also. Here is the debate that I have referenced. The debate was between Ken Milne, who is the owner of the, the uh, Skeptics Guide to Emergency Medicine. Ken, uh, although he is our chief of staff at a small rural hospital, is really internationally known. He has been internationally honored, in fact, and he does emergency room locums in, in fly-in zones in Northern Ontario, in Manitoba, and uh, he speaks everywhere. Uh, I believe he was down in Australia a few months ago as a keynote speaker at a conference down there. So he is very renowned. He debated the issue of mandatory mask wearing with Dr. Joe Vipond, who is an emergency room physician in Calgary. So this was this took place on a Facebook site that was for doctors only. It was closed to the general public. So I couldn't listen to it as it happened. It has been posted on that Facebook page the Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine. So you can go listen to it. It's just a tad over an hour long. But the next day after the debate, I tweeted to Dr. Milne and I asked him, as you, you can see there, he was replying to me, who was declared the victor in the debate? And Ken was declared the victor. So what they did, Joe Vipond responded as well. At the beginning of the debate, they did a poll amongst all the doctors. The members of this Facebook page are all doctors. They did a poll to see who believed in mandatory universal masking and who didn't. At the beginning of the debate, uh, he Joe is indicating 60% support for universal masking. But by the end of the debate, only 43% were in favor and Dr. Ken Milne was declared the victor. So he had brought forward uh, a, a great deal of evidence-based science to indicate that universal masking should not be mandatory. Now, he makes the point that he is not against wearing masks. It has to be done properly, and it has to be done, as he says, smart masking is more beneficial. So you can listen to that debate, but really smart masking is what we're going to be talking about. He gave it a name, and I think that's a pretty good name. So let's uh, go forward in our slides. Despite any debate that you hear, despite even this information I'm giving you today, keep your ears open, keep your eyes open, and keep your minds open more in particular, because new data is constantly coming 
forward, they are constantly coming up with new materials, new ways of engineering those materials, and new ways of layering materials in order to make things more effective. So it's a changing world. Here is actually an example of a study that has been done recently, and I was just sent this last night. So again, this is another evidence-based peer-reviewed article that talks about some tests being done on different materials, okay? Now you'll see in there, uh, there is limited knowledge available on the performance of various commonly available fabrics used in cloth masks. The studies that were done by this group of people looked at cotton, silk, chiffon, flannel, various synthetics, and their combinations. They found the combinations such as cotton and silk, cotton and chiffon, cotton and flannel performed best. That those combinations were greater than 80% efficient on particles that were less than 300 nanometers. Now, a virus particle, a, a, a SARS-CoV-2 particle is 125 nanometers in diameter. Very sciencey, you're not going to recommend it, or remember it rather. But they did find that these combinations of materials were quite effective um, on these types of particles. Cotton, the most widely used material for cloth masks, performs better at higher weave density. So think high thread count. You know, we always hear that in bed sheets, bed linens, high thread count. The higher the thread count, so the more dense the material, the more effective masks made of those materials are going to be. However, the studies also imply that gaps caused by improper fit of the mask can result in over a 60% decrease in the filtration efficiency. So it's not only the material that matters, it's how the mask is fashioned and how you use it. For goodness sake, for goodness sake, avoid Dr. Google, rumor, speculation, and Facebook recipes. One Facebook thing that I have seen all over the place is coffee filters. Just put a coffee filter in behind your mask. That's your ticket. No, it's not your ticket. Think about it. What is the job of a coffee filter? It's to let water through. A coffee filter's job is to let water through. Why would you use it to prevent virus particles, which are liquid, from getting through? You can't. There are also lots of articles out there that say, uh, that have headlines. Face masks are the cure, face masks work. And then you read the article. I, I've seen four of them that I can think of now. You read through the body of the article and towards the end, they will say something like face masks alone cannot be said to be the cause of these wonderful numbers. But in combination with things like social distancing, keeping your hands off your face and staying home, this has resulted in lower numbers. So do watch those headlines. And if you see a headline, don't automatically go share, read the article, because it may not be what you actually think it is. Now then, I asked Ken Milne, again, the Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine. I asked him about the donning and doffing. So, you know, I do watch the discussions closely, I do, uh, I do watch things with what I hope is an open mind because I do believe in following the science. However, in the absence of understanding proper donning and doffing, for instance, aren't people potentially just flinging virus around all over the place? 
and Ken answered me and said, trained healthcare workers, that's what HCW stands for, trained healthcare workers have difficulty adhering to donning and doffing protocols. I suspect that the general public would be less careful than trained healthcare workers. The, that would negate any potential benefit of cloth mask wearing in public or even potentially increase the transmission. So, fortunately for us, science has given us safe protocols for donning, doffing, cleaning, and storage. Donning, by the way, is putting on. Doffing is taking off. Okay? I looked at the CDC. I looked at the NIH. I looked at various um, health sites around the world, country-level health sites, and the best one I found was right here, the government of Canada. It's not that the others didn't give proper protocols. It's that sometimes they skipped steps that I saw on the government of Canada website. So I think that that is really very important to make sure that no steps are skipped when you're giving public education. So here is what they say. You can go to uh, Canada.ca and look up face masks. Just search face masks. You will find all of this. How to protect others. So it does say that the best way to protect others is to wash your hands frequently with warm water and soap for 20 seconds at least. If none is available, use a hand sanitizer made of 60% alcohol at least. You should stay home. You should maintain a two meter distance. When physical distancing cannot be maintained, consider wearing a non-medical mask or homemade face covering and avoid touching your face, mouth, nose, or eyes. Wearing a handmade face covering slash non-medical mask in the community has not been proven to protect the person wearing it, and it is not to be regarded as a substitute for physical distancing and hand washing. However, it can be an additional measure, even if you have no symptoms, to protect others around you. So that is really an important thing. It is a tool in the toolkit. Think of it that way. Putting it on properly is super, super important. Make sure that the mask is clean and dry. Wash your hands with warm water and soap for at least 20 seconds before you even touch the mask. If warm water and soap are not available, use a hand sanitizer with minimum 60% alcohol base. Ensure that your hair is away from your face. Place the face covering over your nose and mouth and secure it using the ties and elastics. Adjust it if needed and it should fit snugly all around. There should be no gaps on the side. And that is quite often where you will see masks failing is that there will be gaps right here along the cheek line. And then you have to go back and wash your hands again. Wash your hands in warm soap and water for 20 seconds at least, or use hand sanitizer with a minimum 60% alcohol base. And then keep your hands off your face. Keep your hands off your face. And if you do touch your face inadvertently, because, you know, people, I think it's 20 times an hour, touch their face and don't even realize it. If you do touch your face right away, go and wash your hands or use that alcohol-based hand sanitizer because you have contaminated yourself. Let's assume that there are virus particles on your mask. You can't see them. I wish they were purple or the sparkly or something, but they're not. So you have to assume that they're there. And the moment you touch your face or your mask, you have contaminated yourself. And then removal is just as important. How often do I see people coming out of a grocery store and getting in their car and they whip their mask off and shove it in their purse? They whipped their mask off and possibly flung virus particles all over their car. And then they shoved it in their purse, thereby contaminating every single thing in their purse. That's not the proper way to doff a face mask. 
Here's what you do. First, you wash your hands with warm water and soap for 20 seconds or use a hand sanitizer. Remove the face mask covering by untying or removing the ear loops from your ears. Do not touch the front of the face mask. Put it in a plastic bag, like think Ziploc or think a Tupperware container. So you've got to think ahead and bring that with you. Think of all of those things and then seal it up completely and then wash your hands again. Yes, there's a lot of hand washing in this or used alcohol based hand sanitizer. That is how you take a mask off very carefully, very gently, very precisely. Don't let me see you whipping it off your face. All right, cleaning and disposing of them. If you plan to reuse the mask, wash it again before wearing it. Change your cloth mask as soon as it gets damp or soiled. So you might cough, you might be talking, you are expelling moisture molecules out of your mouth if you do any of those things. You don't have to be sick to be doing that. People cough and sneeze because it's pollen season. You know, I've got allergies to grass and trees. I sneeze when I'm out and about. That's dampening the, the inside of the mask. And if that dampness actually soaks through the mask, then that dampness is providing a wicking, uh, a wicking mechanism for the virus to come through the mask. I hadn't thought of that until I saw a respirologist from Nova Scotia interviewed on the CBC one day, and she was describing how a damp mask is a bad thing and why. And that's what she said. It will actually allow the virus to wick through. So you don't want to do that. All right. So you wash it with hot water, dry it on a hot cycle. And if you are wearing medical masks that should be discarded, throw them away. And please, people, don't leave them in the grocery carts. Don't leave gloves in the grocery carts. Don't throw them on the ground. Put them in the garbage. That is the proper thing to do with them. All right. As we move forward, it is important to follow the science, not the money. There are tons of people who are making a bundle of money off of vulnerable people who just want to be safe. We all just want to be safe, but these people are making a bunch of money. The latest thing I saw was a trikini. Do you know what a trikini is? It's a bikini with a face mask that matches. Yeah, people are doing that. Be very careful about what you buy. Be very careful because what you think you may be spending money on is not necessarily something that will protect you. I saw two days ago when I was doing research for this slide presentation that copper masks are starting to be a thing. Now, copper is something that does kill viruses, but people are starting to make copper masks and selling them as the magic solution. The amount of copper matters. So if you are seeing this, make sure you do some very dense research and make sure you know what you're buying, okay? So that is the copper mask piece. So in terms of following the science, not the money, let me show you something that I saw last week. What's wrong with these pictures? This is a dermatologist in New York City. Her handle is Pillow Talk Derm, and she made these, or has a part in making or selling or profiting from these face masks that are all cute. And as she was demonstrating these to her audience, she said, so you go into a coffee shop and you want a coffee. What do you do with this? Well, you just pull it down below your chin. And that's the middle picture you're looking at when she was demonstrating that. She made a joke about how it'll cover up your double chin and then you can drink your coffee. The last picture on the right is the one where she was demonstrating that if you just want to push it up and completely out of the way, you can push it up on your head and voila, it's a headband. Now, what did we just learn about how face masks should be handled? And what is she doing? 
but pulling them down and shoving them up, manhandling them, you should put them into place and not touch them. So I questioned her on this. I sent her a direct message and said, could you please address it? I thought I was quite, I thought I was really quite polite. Moving them off the face as you showed in the previous slide is not consistent with what I understand the protocol should be. And it seems to negate any good the mask might do as we contaminate it and possibly fling virus particles about. So you can read that. I thought I was very polite. She responded and said, well, these masks are by no means meant to be used all day by people in hospital settings. Well, that wasn't my question. Or coming into contact with a lot of people and her justification is that if the CDC is recommending handkerchiefs be put on faces, which is what, they, what she is saying they did, they're basically pushing for people to cover their face. And then she removes herself from this argument by saying Allure, which is a magazine for people who don't know, had three healthcare workers actually design the masks and I wasn't part of it. That said, they need to be washed to avoid contamination. Well, you're already contaminating them by touching them and by pulling them down below your, your face and by putting them up on your head. Follow the science, not the money. This is money. This is sales. Now, I believe she may have said that this the sales or her part of it was going to charity. I don't care. You are demonstrating for people as a doctor improper use of a face mask and that's not okay all right let's go on to the next one so now with all that we have learned what's wrong with these pictures these are pictures that i took from the internet and also pictures that i took from um the tv a lot of good morning america reporters because i you know i grabbed all of these or most of these pictures within the first 30 minutes of their news report where are their face masks you see in the top left hand corner this fellow has taken his face mask off one ear loop and it's just hanging down the side you see a reporter with his blue face mask down by his neck the next one has decided in the yellow to tuck her her face mask in her shirt the one on the top right hand side has tucked it underneath her jacket the one on the bottom has a black face mask i'm not sure how well you can see that but it's just off to the side. In the middle on the bottom, we say A-Rod and Jennifer Lopez out for a ride on their bicycles. Jennifer Lopez is wearing it correctly. A-Rod is not even covering his nose or his mouth with his face mask. <sighs> A-Rod. And then we see another reporter, and I believe I grabbed that one on Sunday. And he's actually holding his face mask in his hand. So, the, I mean, these people are all contaminating their face masks as they move them off to the side, pull them down, shove them off, tuck them in their clothing. Contamination city, this is not the right way. So, you know, I'm very concerned about how people who are in the public eye are modeling this sort of behavior. I will also mention that I watched part of the ceremony, um, the repatriation ceremony, where um, the Corsica helicopter crash in Greece when the two bodies were repatriated to Canada and lined up very nicely was the Prime Minister of Canada and there were several officials from his government and from the Air Force, from the various forces. To his credit, Justin Trudeau, not that I saw, touched his mask once. All the others were fussing with it and pulling at it and scratching and moving it. And, you know, not good. So I, the one thing I will mention that I didn't mention when, when we were looking at that study about the various materials that they were testing, the cottons, the flannels, and so forth, if you choose to layer a cloth mask with any of those materials, please do make sure that you test this out in your home because it did strike me that something like flannel would be very itchy or tickly. And if something is disturbing you in terms of your wearing of this for any period of time and you are tempted to touch it, 
meaning to or not meaning to, then it's not going to serve you well. Okay, just bear that in mind. So the last thing that I want to show you is just kind of fun. I'm going to go back to my screen when I get this up. Now, this is from the Skeptic's Guide to Emergency Medicine. He posted this just this morning, and it was some photos of people who went to some very interesting lengths to design masks that they felt would keep them safe. And I thought it would just be sort of a humorous way to bring the point home that you've got to be careful about the face mask that you're using. So here's a person who has pulled a plastic bag over her head. Ah, this, this woman's going to a party. Yep. This fellow pulled a paper bag over his head and it looks like he's wearing plastic from head to toe. This is a water bottle <laughs> that this person has cut out so as to enable himself to put it on. That's pretty ingenious. This is the sort of packaging that you would buy um, comforters and sheets in, and, and she's just unzipped it to the point where she can pull it over her head. Uh, another plastic bag. I don't even know what this is. It looks, <laughs> it looks like he might have cut holes in, the, in this rolled up newspaper so that he can see. Okay. <laughs> oh, where's his head? Yep. This woman is wearing a sanitary napkin, and it looks like that guy behind her must be her husband, because they are both wearing sanitary napkins. This is a shoe. I don't know if you can see that picture well, but he has tied his sneaker around his face. And there we're back to that fellow again. So, okay, that is, that is kind of fun. People are going to great lengths. Um, so let's just see, I'm gonna get the comments window up and I'm going to see if any of you have any comments, anything that you want to address. Ah, Marcy, yes, you're talking about the toilet lid. Yes, it makes sense, you always close the lid. Yes, you know, it is such a habit. And let me say also that in many public washrooms, and I think of airports, um, lots of commercial buildings, the toilets don't even have lids that you can close. So I did read a recommendation about that. I'm not really sure how able people are going to be able to do to follow it. But what they said was when, when you see somebody come out of a washroom where there is no lid on the toilet seat, wait 10 or 15 minutes for all of the virus particles to descend to the floor and then go in and use the washroom. Well, in public washrooms, I'm not really sure how effective that is going to be, but maybe that makes a good case for going to the bathroom before you leave home. But it certainly makes a good case, uh, this, this business of spewing particles, it certainly makes a good case for closing the toilet seat lid. For those of you who may have joined us late, you can go back in the presentation and see this will be archived. You can see the piece where we were talking about the uh, toilet seats and how virus particles do shed in stool. Have you had your lunch yet? <laughs> May not be what you want to hear. Anyway, that is the presentation on proper mask wearing. Again, I'm not telling you do or don't wear a mask. I'm telling you, if you're going to wear a mask, do it properly. Otherwise, you negate any benefit that you may get for yourself from wearing the mask. And that's not what we want to see. We want to see people who do choose to wear masks doing it safely and understanding that they are doing their best to protect themselves. Okay? So this post will be archived forever. You can go back and watch it. It's a long one. I realize we're, we're coming up on 50 minutes, but I think this was something that required a full explanation. And, and I didn't want to just scoot through any of it for you. So if you have any comments or questions, leave them below even after the show. I will keep my eye on them and do my best to answer them as quickly as possible. All right, everybody, have yourself a great day. 
Take care of yourselves. Please, please be well. Take care of yourselves. Take care of one another. And do remember that it takes a village to age a senior. Bye, everybody.